I'm Amy Eisenstein. I'm here with Kashana Palmer, CEO of Kashana & Co. And she is a recovering fundraiser, trainer, speaker, and consultant extraordinaire. And I'm so happy to have her. Hi, Kashana. Hey, Amy. How are you? I am so glad to be here with you. <laughs> Good. Well, we are going to talk about some important topics today. We're going to yeah. talk about recruitment and race. So talk about uh, what's on your mind lately. Yeah, you know, for me, like, I think I spend most of my time working with some really great organizations. And one of the things that I see folks really struggling with is finding and keeping great talent. Yeah. You know, and I know it's sort of like a duh, like that's like the test of the ages, right? Yeah, yeah. But like, what are we really going to do about the challenge that there are really amazing people out there who want to come into our sector, who are ready to do some really fantastic work and help us create some amazing runway for our organizations to activate mission. Yeah. But we just can't seem to connect the dots. Mm, so true, you right? Know? It's such a timely and important topic because yeah. it's such an issue in our sector. So what do we what do we need to do about it? You know, one of the things that I am constantly thinking about and wanting to like wring folks neck sometime is like we've got to start with our why. Mm. Like why are we actually looking for new talent? It's not just because Bob left the organization and finally retired and now we're like, oh my gosh, we've got to replace him. What are we going to do? Right. No, you have to like really take a step back and think about what do we need to do next to be able to advance our goals and yeah. to really be able to move the, the needle, you know, and then think about the types of individuals you want to bring into our organizations that will help us do it, do that. And so I think that that's one of the things that we don't do enough of. We just go into go mode. Yeah. But we've got to stop for a second and go, wait a minute, why are we doing any of this stuff anyway? It's such an important point. I mean, we just automatically assume that when somebody leaves, we need to replace them. But that's maybe not the go to place we should start at yeah. and think about this in terms of succession planning and thoughtful process of why we have the staff we have. Great. What Absolutely. else? Absolutely. And really getting down to the brass tacks of what is the type of talent that we're really looking for. Yeah. I think that, you know, that we pay a lot of lip service to wanting to have a diverse pool and diverse teams and diversity period, almost to the point where when you hear folks talk about diversity or equity or inclusion, we almost kind of like roll our eyes a little bit. Mm. You know, like we know we need to talk about it. Okay, Kajana. And then we move on. And I'm here to say like, okay, great. I get it that we've talked about it enough and yeah. I'm kind of exhausted too, but let's get ready to act. I don't think we've talked about it enough. Maybe it's because we don't know how to talk about it. Let's talk about how to talk about it. Yeah, I think for me, I, you know, it's funny you say that. I, I agree with that. Maybe I'm like, maybe I feel like I talked about it. But I think that <laughs> what I find is that how to talk about it starts with what are we really trying to achieve in our organization? Like, why is it actually really important for us to truly have a representative team? You know, it's a fact that philanthropy is changing. Yeah. And all the types of donors that are looking to really connect with organizations and be co-creators and co-authors mm -hmm. with organizations to do some transformative work, yeah. they're looking to also see folks that look like them and that they can identify with and are representative from the communities they come from. Yeah. And if our teams don't reflect that, then we're like behind the times. And I'm sort of exhausted about being behind the times. You know, yeah. I want to catch up with social media and catch up with this technology. We're constantly playing catch up. And so instead of playing catch up, let's get proactive. Let's think about what does our organization really look like? Why mm -hmm. are we that way? And yeah. are we actually ready to do something about it? And if the answer is, you know what? Yes, let's do something about it. Then let's just make a decision that we're gonna roll up our sleeves, yeah. we're gonna get some help, and yeah. we're gonna really think about how to create practices and processes and all of the things that, and policies that are important to help folks who have typically been marginalized in the workforce to find their place at the table and to be able to have a say in what happens when they get there. Yeah, and and I didn't mean to be dismissive before no, no. about that we ha maybe haven't talked about it 
enough. We've talked, I was having a conversation earlier with someone about why are we in this state where in this day and age women still aren't in leadership roles Hello. and positions. And I think it's the same things with people of color and all sorts of other minorities that we just aren't where we need to be. And so whether we've been talking about it forever or right. not, we still need to keep talking about it. Yeah, and I think, and I agree with that, and I don't think you were being dismissive at all. I just feel like I get it, you know, like since it's the thing that I didn't even, this is like a, a charge that I didn't even want to take up initially. Yeah. You know, I have been living in this skin a long time, you know, yeah. a little seasoned, you see. <laughs> um, but you're not that seasoned. But listen, yeah. you just give me my, you just give me my season, okay? Yeah. But, you know, but for me, it was like, okay, as we're starting to see some generational shifts at work, mm -hmm. and as we're starting to see some generational shifts in folks who are looking to seek leadership, and particularly now that, thank goodness, we're starting to elevate the conversation about why it's so critical to have more of our voice as women in philanthropy and in positions of leadership and in positions of influence who are truly ready to make the kind of change we need to see. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that the voice of women of color, of professionals of color, do not get lost yeah. in that great work. Yeah. And so it's an important conversation to have and also action step to take around making sure that when you're recruiting new talent, are you making sure that at every level of your um, interview process, are you making sure that folks are represented at every level? Yeah. Or yeah. just in the regular pool. You know, we got 100 resumes and 10% of them were these different types of boxes we can check. Now that we've moved them into the finals, we tried. Mm. That's not good enough anymore. Yeah. Like we really have to go back to the basics and say, okay, we'd, we've established why it's important for yeah. our leadership to look this way, and we are not satisfied with having a diverse set of candidates and diverse set of employees at the associate level, at the assistant level, at the program manager level, right. at the manager level. We want to make sure that we create pathways for folks to be able to step into leadership positions and make sure they get the um, ability to build social capital, they get the mentorship and the sponsorship, mm. that they have, we have practices and policies that support the kinds of lives that folks are having when they come into work yeah. that are not biased for the majority culture that already exists. Are we ready to start doing that work? Yeah, give me some examples of some policies that might be biased that yeah. people aren't even aware of. Yeah, so a really good one that actually happened to me early on in my career is that I joined an organization that had a hiring policy that when you started, you didn't get your first paycheck until a month after you started. What? I mean, hello. <laughs> Look, how can anybody work under uh, those conditions? I mean, and what, what the HR director told me at that time was just put it on your credit card. Oh, no. Um, Everybody, I just want to say this for the record, does not have a credit card with thousands and thousands of dollars on it. And there are lots of folks who do not live in the credit economy and don't use credit cards. Was card this a periods. nonprofit organization? Yes, oh, absolutely. That breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. And yeah. so it'd be things like, oh, just put that on your credit card and we'll reimburse you. Right. So you want me to make a charge for a travel trip for a donor right now that I have to wait until I get the statement and then I wait three more weeks after that for you to then reimburse me? That, that's a great point. And I think it's not just at the beginning of a job, it's, it's any, throughout, any, the, throughout job, the job, right? right? Yeah. And so then it ends up biasing, lean, you know, leaning bias towards folks who can afford, right. I use that word quotation marks, afford, yeah. or have the type of credit or disposable income or whatever to be able to make those types of decisions. Right. If you're not able to do that. Which is not a lot of people in the nonprofit exactly. sector in general. In general, but if you're yes. in a position to do that, yeah. and then there are folks who can't, then and all of a sudden, it, you know, we start to give the eyes. Oh, you're not right. able to put your flight on. Oh, you can't book the whole conference and right. be reimbursed eight weeks from now. <laughs> you know, yeah. like so those kind of yeah. policies. Typically, yeah. so financial policies are one. Okay. Pay cycles are another. Okay. Um, how people are able to take their personal time off yeah. is another. So lots well, of our go go into detail yeah, on that so one. For example, like what? Like, when people are allowed to be able to go take time off with their families, yeah. um, how they're able to access the time. There's some organizations that have started to become very great about having sort of open-ended policies about family leave, and yeah. not just the legal stuff, okay? Right. Not the unpaid time, but actually like, you can go ahead and leave work at four o'clock if you need to pick someone up, and pick. nobody's gonna be looking at you out the side of their eye, right. um, versus somebody else who can stay till six. So flexibility yeah. around how you use your time yeah. is 
another one that favors folks, for example, who don't have children. Clearly. And it does not favor folks, for example, who do or who are caregivers, have to take care of parents or right. et cetera. And so just even thinking about just like the way that we live and work and how policies like that, for example, yeah. will show up that will mm -hmm. bias folks who have the ability to do more. Right. And it doesn't bias, and, and you know, it sits against folks who can't do yeah. those similar things. So those are some of the things that I've seen. Those are great examples. So what steps can organizations take who are now aware of the issue but don't really know how to proceed? What are some next steps that they can take in, in addition to looking at some of these policies? Yeah, I think like really bringing people to the table to have conversations about what's working. So one of the things that I love is if not just doing an anonymous survey mm -hmm. internally, because sometimes the surveys really don't bubble up to the surface, what's really happening in the subcultures of your organization, particularly for potentially marginalized or actual marginalized groups. Okay. And so bringing in some external folks to be able to help with that, looking at external data about what actually happens in organizations when you have policies or practices that favor dominant culture in your organization over others. Okay. That's the first step, I think, or one of the first steps you could take. Okay. Um, not just doing a diversity treat and bringing in some trainer to talk to you guys for eight hours and you feel good and your heart is warm <laughs> and then you can just go on with life no but being able to start to look at actionable steps um, I, I pick policies for example because those are the things that sort of live on in perpetuity yeah you know, just like dress codes <laughs> things that live on forever yeah and so starting with the places that are gonna have impacts on the way people get paid mm. on the way people live mm -hmm. on the way people are hired yes in the hiring practice for example recruited, recruited too, right you know yeah oh, I don't know if they're gonna be a um, if they're gonna fit and I always say, the minute you say, oh, I don't know if they're going to be fit, most people lean back when they do it. Yeah. That's your imp implicit unconscious bias coming in right. right there. Right. Yeah. So how do we get out of that fit, right? Because yeah. we want people who are going to be a fit, but that tends to recruit people that look and sound just like us. Absolutely. So how do we break that? I think for me, the way I've been in, and, and granted, believe it or not, I've struggled with this myself as a hiring manager. Yeah. So I am not immune to any of this stuff. Really being able to focus on core competencies. What does the job require? I mean, you know, how many job descriptions have we looked at over the years that are just like a running ticker tape of tasks? <laughs> yes. Not a responsibility to be seen, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and so are we looking at core competencies yeah. and saying what is actually necessary for the role, going back to that why, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then what are the types of individuals that would have those types of core competencies? Right. They may not look like fundraisers from this particular type of fundraising shop or that particular fundraising shop. Yeah. They may not necessarily even be quote unquote traditional fundraisers. Yeah. But if you focus on the competencies necessary to be successful in the role, mm -hmm. then you start to be a little bit more flexible. <laughs> on the types of individuals that get to come party with you and get yeah. to come to the table. Yeah. And then you test for the work. Mm. And so instead of asking about, you know, well, you just, you've got to be able to close seven figure gifts in order to be able to do this or do that and getting hung up on some, certain hard skills you need to have. Let's yeah. be honest. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. You're not going to be just writing grants your whole life and then magically you're going to step into doing major gifts. No, you need to have some transition right. and some training. Yeah. Oh, hello. Yeah. Um, but are you able to be able to test for that work? And so if you're hiring for a position that requires you to be very detail oriented, to be able to build relationships, mm -hmm. um, to be able to be very persuasive, yep. in your organization, can you build some scenarios that when an individual comes in that you can actually have conversations or have them walk you through mm. how they would handle yes. something that actually happens in your organization yeah. that addresses those actual competencies? Right. Great. I want to say simple and easy, but like that's a way to start, you yeah. know? No, so, that's what we all need to do. We need to start. We need to be aware of it. We need to be thinking about it and taking action. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. good. You have any final thoughts or yeah. parting tips you want to leave with the viewers? Totally. You know, this is hard work. Like, let us not even pretend that this is a, a, this is not, I call it, this is not crock pot love. You can't set it and forget it. Put all the ingredients <laughs> in, close up the crock pot. You can't do that. This is hard work. You've got to stir it and you've got to sim it. That's what you just got to do. You got to really be able to focus on that. So understand that it's a process that takes time, but it's one that you have to come back to time and time again. It has to be a part of what makes sense for your organization strategically mm -hmm. and should be directly tied to outcomes for your organization that are tied to success. Yeah. Not some committee off on the side that's doing this work and they report back, but a part of the fabric of the way your organization works and a part of the culture of your organization for make sure that people are engaged and happy. So do the work. Beautiful. And it starts from the board on down. Exactly. 
Exactly. It's top down. It's side to side. Mm. It can't just be the folks in the it, you know in the mix who are doing that frontline work saying it. It has to be something that comes from the board to that executive director or CEO through your advancement leadership and straight on down. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for thank being you here. Thank so you for having me. This is awesome. I always love talking with you. Me too. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me. For even more videos, interviews, tools, and resources, I hope you'll visit my website, amyeisenstein.com, and subscribe to my weekly newsletter.